All right, so start at zero. Look at your unit circle. We are gonna start with the sine graph, sine of theta, all right? Equals some number, right? So this would be my x value, sine of x, plugging it in, equals y. So let's say that's a function, all right? If I plug in a zero for sine, what's the value that's gonna yield? So if I, what is the sine of zero? Zero, all right? So let's go to pi over two, all right? Pi over two. Let's make this zoomed in a little bit. If I plug in pi over two, what's the sine value of pi over two? It's gonna be one, right? Let's go to pi. If I plug in zero for sine, what's the sine of pi? I'm plugging in a pi. What's the sine of pi? Y value on your unit circle? Zero. zero, all right? Let's go to three pi over two. What's the sine value of three pi over two? Negative one. And let's go to two pi. What's the sine value of two pi? Zero. zero, all right? So you see what I just did? I plugged in a zero, I got a zero for sine. I plugged in a pi over two, I got a one for sine. I plugged in a pi, I got a zero for sine. So you plug in an x, you solve for y, right? We're just graphing x, y on the coordinate plane. But they have put the coordinate plane in radians, right? That's all it is. Pi over two is a number. Pi is a number, okay? So what happens at two pi? What's gonna happen here? I have done a complete circle. What's gonna happen to my function? At this point, it's gonna repeat, right? So if I go to five pi over two, that's gonna be the same as one pi over two, right? And so it's gonna go up to one. If I go to three pi, that's gonna be the same as pi. Does everybody see what's happening? It's a cyclic function. It will cause a cycle, all right? If I go the negative direction, it's exactly what it is, all right? So negative pi over two, that's gonna be negative one because that's gonna be the same as my three pi over two. Negative pi, well, that's gonna be the same as pi. Um, negative three pi over two, that's gonna be the same as pi over two. Negative two pi, and so I have this guy starting to form here. That looks like a sine function. That's what your sine function looks like, it's a wave, all right? And yes, sound waves do the same thing. In fact, we're gonna talk about frequency Right, and periods and all that you probably would have talked about when you've studied sound waves in science or some type of frequency in science, all right? This makes sense. I was about so, it's just so it's not just flipping around a circle. That is what happens to figure out your angular functions, your x and y of your angular. When you then graph that function, so think of it just like y equals mx plus b. If I graph y equals mx plus b, I'm going to get a line all day, every day, no matter what my M is, no matter what my B is, it's gonna look like a line, okay? Now, it'll be a sharper line, it'll move around on the graph, but it will be a line. When I graph a sine function, it will look like this all day, every day. It may stretch, and it may put you push together, it may be stretched out or stretched tall, but it will always look like a wave. Always look like a wave. And we're gonna, we're gonna sketch these um, based, just like we did with um, quadratics. Quadratics form a parabola, right? Depending on what the parabola says is where it is on the graph, is how sharp the parabola is, whether the parabola is facing up or down, right? Your A, Bs, and Cs determine what happens with the parabola, yes? yes? Same thing with a sine graph. It will always look like this, but you can stretch it, pull it out, depending on um, your amplitude and period and frequency, okay? So this is what your sine graph looks like. What I want you to notice about the sine graph, it is broken up into four key points, four key points. Your sine graph will always start at your zero, all right? Now, there will be situations where you start at zero and then you shift up or you shift right or left, but your basic function starts at zero, okay? It also ends at two pi, all right? This is a standard sine graph. At two pi, it starts over, okay? So your standard graph is this portion right here. This portion right here is one cycle of your sine graph, all right? So if, if, you, are, if you haven't adjusted at all, the whole cycle is gonna repeat at two pi, all right? There is a halfway point 
At the halfway point, it will always be back at zero. So it will start at zero, it will end at zero. At the halfway point, it will be back at zero, okay? One-fourth of the way through, you are at your highest point. Three-fourths of the way through, you are at your lowest point, all right? So then when you start graphing these, and we're going to graph them with shifts and with adjustments, you have to figure out your starting and ending point. Those are the same number. Then you have to figure out what your middle point is. That's going to be the same number. And then your highest and your lowest. And then you have graphed one cycle of your sign, even if it has shifted or stretched or whatever. This is what your sign graph look, looks like. If I were to plug in a zero for cosine, what is my cosine value at zero? Positive one. All right, my cosine value at zero is positive one. All right, my cosine value of pi over two. Cosine value, x value at pi over two. Zero, yeah, it's top. It's right here. Mm -hmm. All right, cosine value at pi. Negative one. Cosine value at three pi over two. And cosine value at two pi. One. So your cosine graph looks like this. It's like the sine graph just shifted over. All right? And if I were to keep going, right, I would, it would look something like this, right? And if I were to keep going over here, it would look something like this. All right? So it looks just like the sine graph, doesn't it? It's just shifted. All right? It's actually shifted by one quadrant. Um, which is what happens, right? So if I'm down here, it's a one, zero. And if I'm up here, it's a zero, one. Negative one, zero, zero, negative one. So it literally just shifts, okay? So <clears throat> what you'll notice, so for one cycle of the cosine then, this would be one cycle of cosine. It's still broken up into fourths, all right? Still broken up into fourths. I start, however, at my highest point, and I end at my highest point for a cosine graph. In the middle, I'm at my lowest point of my cosine graph. And at one-fourth and at three-fourths of the way through, I am at zero. I'm at the zero. All right? Or at the line that runs through the middle is basically what that is. Okay? Some properties. This is on the first page of your section here in graphing sine and cosine, page 256, all right? So your sine function has a domain of negative, pi to, negative infinity to positive infinity. Your x values, your input for sine can be anything, right? It goes negative infinity to positive infinity. This is a cyclic function that is infinite, all right? Your range, however, can only be negative one to positive one. Let's think about why that is. So with SOHCAHTOA, go back to SOHCAHTOA, sine is which two sides? Opposite over hypotenuse. What is your hypotenuse in a right triangle? It's the long, specifically, it's the side opposite your, your right angle, and it is always the longest side. Always, right? So the most it could be is one, because across, so if, let's look at your 90 degree angle. 90 degrees has a sine of one. We know that on the unit circle. Why is that? Because the opposite side of a 90 degree angle is which side? The hypotenuse. So for a right angle, it would be hypotenuse over hypotenuse, which is one, right? So any other angle is gonna be smaller than 90 degrees by definition. It can't be larger than 90, right? In a right angle, in a right triangle. So the hypotenuse should be my longest side. It can never be bigger than one. If my longest side is my denominator, my sine can never be bigger than one. It can never be smaller than negative one. So in your calculators, if you were to put in inverse sine of two, you would get an error. It would say mm, you're outside of your domain, okay, or your range. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the range or the output value for sine and cosine is always negative one or positive one. Now here's the deal. You can have a sine function that is multiplied by five, right? Well, then you're taking your sine value, negative one and positive one, and multiplying it by five. So your final answer for your graph could go up to five and down to negative five, but the sine function itself would never be more than that. Does that make sense? Okay. So your um, range is positive one to negative one. Same thing for cosine. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. 
Adjacent is always going to be smaller than hypotenuse. So it cannot go above one. All right. Um, your, your X intercepts are always going to be pi and zero or one of your odd numbered pi's and zeros for sine function and one of your um, half pi's and zero. So think about where it is. All right. It's always going to cross the X axis when the other guy is zero. All right. That's how it's going to cross. So here's what it has down here. All right, it oscillates between negative one and positive one. Oscillates, you know that term, right? Goes back and forth, oscillates. Think about an oscillating fan, right? Um, <clears throat> we are breaking this up into quarters when we start graphing these. All right, so just some information you need to be aware of with sine and cosine. So let's look at graph them. All right, so the first thing they talk about here is at the bottom, page 256. Um, one period means how many times it cycles, like how, uh, how long it takes to do a complete cycle, one complete cycle. Um, it is, cosine is a translation or a shifted version of the sine graph. Any transformation of the sine function is called a sinusoid function. So cosine is also considered a sinusoid function because it is just a translation of sine, all right? So... <clears throat> And let's look at these three graphs that they have given us right here on the top of page 257. All right. My basic sine function is this blue one that's running through here. All right. This is my basic sine function. All right. It goes up to one and down to negative one. Basic sine function. All right. Let's look at the red one. The red one here is two sine of x. That one goes up to two and down to negative two. It still crosses the zeros at the same exact point. The only thing that changed is how far it went up and down. So when they multiplied by two, it just created this higher peak and lower valley. Look at the green function. They multiplied by one half. It went up to one half and down to one half. All right. This is called amplitude. Amplitude is... Um, half the distance between the maximum and the minimum values. So like for the two sine, from positive two to negative two is four, right? So my amplitude is two, all right? With a sine and cosine function, it will always be the number in front of the function, all right? So your amplitude will always be the number in front of the function. So for this one, two sine of x, two is my amplitude. A sine, and they have bx plus c plus d. We'll get into all of those. This is standard form of a sine function. A will always be my amplitude. And it just tells you how far up and how far down to go from your midway point of your function. How far up and how far down to go. All right? So let's graph some of these. All right? They want me to graph sine of x and graph one-fourth the sine of x one-fourth the sine of x. So I'm going to zoom in, and I'm only going to do one cycle here. All right, just one cycle. So I'm going to start at zero. So for my standard sine function, I'm going to start at zero. At one-fourth of the way through, pi over two, I'm going to be at one. At pi, I will be at zero. Three pi over two, negative one, and two pi back at zero. All right? That's my standard sine function right here. Standard sine function. Of course, it keeps going that way. Keeps going that way. All right? <clears throat> now, now they want me to graph that g of x, my next function, is one-fourth the sine of x. One-fourth. Okay? So one-fourth is about right here. I'm going to start at zero. At my one-fourth of the way through, so pi over two, I'm just gonna be here. At pi, I'm gonna be back at zero. At three pi over two, I'm gonna be at negative one-fourth. And at two pi, I'm gonna be back at zero. And so the only thing that changed is my amplitude, how far up I went. It did not change anything else in the graph. It just changed the amplitude how far it went up and how far it went down, all right? <clears throat>
All right, let's look at this one real quick, then I'll do the sine one. So for the cosine, you start at positive one, you go to zero, negative one, zero, positive one. That's your regular cosine. They wanted one third cosine. So you start at one third, go to zero, negative one third, zero, positive one third. All right, let's look at sine. All right, so for sine, you would start at zero, go to positive one, zero, negative one, and zero. And that's my standard sine function. Then they want me to graph five sine of x. So I am gonna start at zero. I'm going to shift this guy down. There we go. I'm gonna go all the way up to five. <clears throat> Back down to zero. Down to negative five and back up to zero. So this guy's gonna look like this. Oh, missed him. Try it again. He's much sharper. Oh, nice. And that would be five sine of x, five sine of x. So reflections, reflections work just like they worked with um, parabolas. If you had a negative in front of your parabola, what did you know about the parabola? That instead of going up, it would go yeah. down, all right? Same thing with these functions. Um, a standard sine graph goes up and then back to zero, down and then back to zero. If you have a negative in front of your sign, you're just gonna think of it flipping over the x-axis, all right? So you still start at zero, but instead of going to your highest point first, you go to your lowest point, and then back up, and then to your highest point, and then back down. So it literally just flips across the x-axis if there's a negative in front of it, just like a quadratic would do, just like a parabola would do. All right, so everything else is the same. Amplitude, you just go to your lowest point, and then back up to your highest point versus the other way around. Cosine would be the same way. Instead of starting at positive one for cosine, if it was negative cosine, I would start at negative one, right? And go up to positive one and back down to negative one. All right, so the negative literally just flips it across the x-axis, all right? All right, so period of a sine and cosine function. The standard period of a sine function is two pi. That is how long it takes for it to cycle one time, one time. There are things that will affect your period. And so the standard form, when you write it in standard form of a sine function is a sine of bx plus c plus d. So numbers that are within your sine function will affect your period. So just like three times the sine of x affected my amplitude, how far it went up and down, the sine of three x will affect how long it takes for it to cycle one time. So instead of my starting and ending point being at zero and two pi, it'll be at zero and something else. It will change how long it takes for it to cycle, all right? The period is how long it takes for it to cycle, all right? So the way that you find this is you take that number that is in front of your x, in front of your x, and you divide two pi by that number. So your period is always gonna be two pi divided by the absolute value of b. Obviously your period's not gonna be a negative number because it's not gonna take a negative amount of time for it to cycle. That doesn't make sense, all right? So two pi divided by the absolute value of b. In this case that I just gave you this example down here, it would be two pi divided by three. That would be a very short cycle, right? It would not take long for it to repeat itself. It would actually make it shorter. If there was a fraction there, it would make your cycle longer, okay? So a whole number makes your cycle shorter. Fraction makes your cycle longer, all right? Let's graph some of these.
It says, describe how the graphs of cosine of x and cosine of x over 3 are related. Then find the period and sketch at least one period of both functions, all right? So that's what we're going to do. We are going to sketch the graph here. Now, for a standard, and I don't think I have enough room on this graph, so we will stretch this guy out, all right? If I were to graph my standard cosine function, I'm going to start at positive 1, right? At pi over 2, I will be at 0. At pi, I'll be at negative 1. At 3 pi over 2, I'll be at 1. And at 2 pi, I'll be back. I mean, 0. And then at 2 pi, I'll be back at 1. And so it's going to look like this. One cycle. There he goes. All right. Now, all of a sudden, I have a new period. So this cosine of pi over 3, I could write that of as g of x equals cosine of one-third x, right? Everybody agree with that? One-third x. My period, I calculate that by saying 2 pi divided by my b. My b here is one-third. So 2 pi divided by one-third. When I keep change flip, I'm going to get 6 pi. Everybody see that? So my period here is going to be 6 pi, all right? So I am going to start at 0, and I am going to end at 6 pi for one cycle. So here's what you do. Divide it into fourths, all right? I'm going to take 0 to 6 pi, and I'm going to cut it in half. Where's my halfway point between 0 and 6 pi? 3 pi. There's my halfway point, all right? Between 0 and 3, what's my halfway point? 1 and a half. So 1 and a half, also known as 3 halves, right? All right? Between 3 and 6, it's going to be 4 and a half, right? Right? 3 to 6 would be, I just add 1 and a half to it, right? So 4 and a half, how would I write that? That would be 9 halves, right? This is actually going to be 9 halves here. 9 halves, all right? So I take my graph and I divide it into fourths. The easiest way to do that is to divide it in half and to divide each half in half, okay? So let's do it again. I always start at positive 1. My amplitude has not changed. There's not a number in front of cosine, all right? At one-fourth of the way through on my cosine graph, I am at 0. There we go. I'm at 0, all right? At halfway through my cosine graph, I am at my lowest point. There we go, lowest point. At three-fourths of the way through, I am back at zero, back at zero. And at the end, I am at my highest point. I am back at one. So now my cosine of, of, of uh, x over three is going to look like this. It took that long to cycle one time. Same graph, a longer period stretches out wide wider, okay?
So the frequency of a sinusoidal function is the number of cycles the function completes in one unit interval. One unit interval. Um, this is actually just the reciprocal of your period. So you'll notice the um, frequency is just absolute value of b over 2 pi. Um, and that is just wanting to see how many times it, um, I guess, oscillates is how you could use the word here in one 2 pi setting. So in a 2 pi, which is a standard cycle, how many times does this actually go through? Um, and this is where we talked about like sound waves. We'll talk about what frequency means. And so if you have a frequency on a sound waves that, that's high, right? High frequency means it's oscillating back and forth quickly. Um, low frequency, it's going to oscillate slower. Um, and so that's what frequency means, both in obviously trig functions as well as if you see it in like a science class as well. The next thing we're going to do with graphing here is a phase shift, phase shift. So phase shift takes your um, trig function and it actually shifts it left or right, all right, left or right. So like with a sine function, you typically start at zero. A phase shift can move it over and your sine function looks exactly the same, but it's just moved over, all right. And so the easiest way to graph these is literally to figure out what your period is and then where your, shape, your phase shift is going to take you, all right? It's gonna take you over to the left and then you'll just do the same thing, start to finish, divide it in half, divide it in fourths and put your points down, all right? How you calculate the phase shift. You're gonna take this C value. So you see it's A sine of BX plus C plus D, C over the absolute value of B. And that tells you where to start, where to start. So for a standard sine graph, it's going to be 0 over 1. So that's why you start at 0. But if you have something else there, you're going to move it to the left and to the right. All right, move it to the left and to the right. So for this, they want us to state the amplitude, period, frequency, and phase shift of this particular function. Then they want to graph two periods of the function. All right, two periods of the function. All right, and this is example 5 on page 261. Example 5 on page 261. So amplitude. So amplitude is the number in front of the sign, right? In front of the sign. What number do we have in front of the sign? Yeah, one. So my amplitude here is one. All right. The next thing they want us to find is frequency. Frequency. My frequency is my absolute value of B over, um, oh wait, we're gonna do period first, sorry. Two pi over the absolute value of B. Two pi over the absolute value of B. So we're gonna do period first and frequency will just reciprocate. So for period, I want two pi over the absolute value of B. B here is three. So I get two pi over three, that's my period. All right, that's how long it's gonna complete one cycle. My frequency is just gonna be the reciprocal of that. So my frequency here is just going to be um, three, two pi, three over two pi. Three over two pi, all right? So those just reciprocate each other. And then we're going to look at phase shift, phase shift, the one we just did. For phase shift, we are going to take my C, right? My C is, all right, now in your original um, formulas here, they are all pluses. So pay attention to that. They're all pluses. So my C here is negative pi over 2, all right? So my C is negative pi over 2. Um, and then that is over the absolute value of 3. And pay attention to my formula for phase shift. The phase shift has a negative in front of it, right? So my phase shift is negative C over absolute value of B. So I have a negative, negative here. So this is actually my phase shift is going to be positive pi over six, over six, okay? 
positive pi over 6. Does that make sense? Right, because I have to combine the 2 and the 3, their denominator, denominator. So positive pi over 6 is my phase shift. So those are the four things I have found. This is a sine graph. So here's what we do when we have a phase shift. We find our starting point, all right? So our starting point is going to be not 0, but 0 plus pi over 6. So it's going to be at pi over 6, all right? Now, I'm not going to be looking that you get this perfectly, right? On this graph, my closest one's pi over 4, all right? So if I were to do, look at this one at pi over 4 here, I know pi over 6 is going to be what? Smaller or bigger than pi over 4? Uh, smaller, all right? So we're going to say pi over 6 is maybe, you know, this is going to be what? Pi over 8. So pi over 6 is going to be like maybe right here. We'll just put it there, all right? Normally, I would go from 0 to 2 pi, all right? I have to look at what my period is, though. So normally, my period is 2 pi. 0 plus 2 pi gives me 0 to 2 pi, all right? My period has changed, though. My period is 2 pi over 3. So if I start at pi over 6, if I'm starting at pi over 6, I need to end 2 pi over 3 away from there. 2 pi over 3 away from there. So I'm going to take my pi over 6 where I'm starting, and I'm going to add my period, 2 pi over 3. What do I need to do there? Find a common denominator. Which is? 6. So that's 4 pi over 6, right? So I should end then at 5 pi over 6, right? 5 pi over 6. Now, again, I'm not looking for exact. 6 pi over 6 is going to be right here at pi, right? Make sense? Um, uh, right, 150 degrees. This is not in degrees. So I'm going to calculate it somewhere over here in between my, so this is going to be what? 3 pi over 6, this is our, yeah, this is going to be 6 pi over 8. We need to get a common denominator here. So it's going to be somewhere in here, and I just need to calculate it closely. I'm not going to make you, like, do it exactly, as long as you label it. So I'm going to label this guy where I start, and I'm going to label this guy where I end. Points. Now you want to mark halfway and a fourth of the way through. Halfway and a fourth of the way through. You can estimate this if it doesn't fall directly on one. Halfway, a fourth of the way through. Um... Just estimate it. It's fine. All right. So you want to mark your halfway and your fourth of the way through. Halfway and fourth of the way through. All right. It's going to be a tiny little graph. Oh, good God. It is. All right. And so what happens? We, a sign starts at zero. At one fourth of the way through, it's at its highest point. Its highest point. Uh, my amplitude did not change, right? It's a one. So my highest point here is still going to be one. At halfway through, it's at zero. At three-fourths of the way through, it's at the lowest point, negative one, and it ends back at zero. So it's going to look something like this, all right? And if I were to keep drawing that, just sketching it, which is what we're doing here, it's going to look something like that. Does that make sense? So when you graph these, when it has a phase shift, you want to mark your starting and your ending point and this divide it in fourths. Divide it in fourths. How does the uh, frequency 
we'll walk through all of this. So amplitude, that was the number in front here, all right? Um, period, that is um, just I, my, I, two pi, my two pi divided by b, right? So pi, my frequency is just the reciprocal of that. Phase shift is my c over b and then negate it. So we get negative pi over three over two, which is pi over six. So I, I typically start at zero for my sign. That's where sign standardly starts. So think about when we did um, absolute value graphs. They typically start at zero, and then you shift up and over or whatever, right? And you just keep that graph, all right? Same thing. So we start at zero. If my phase shift is positive pi over six, then I'm gonna go, I'm not gonna start at zero, I'm gonna start at pi over six, all right? Then I have to decide where I end. Well, my period is pi. So if my, I start at pi over six, I'm gonna start at pi plus pi over six, like seven pi over six, right? So right here, just, just at pi over six past pi, all right? So you take your starting point and you add your period to it to figure out where you end, all right? And then just divide it in fourths. I divide it in half, one fourth, three fourths. I started at zero, I go to my highest point, middle zero, lowest point, back at zero. Okay, and that is my sine graph. So when you're talking about how you move up and down, you determine where your midline is by looking at your standard function and it is the number that is added outside here, outside of the function, all right? The C is added inside the function, the D is added outside of the function, outside of the function, all right? And so that's what you're gonna look at to determine whether or not you go up or down and how far up or down you go. All right, graph vertical translations. State the amplitude, period, frequency, phase shift, and vertical shift of y equals sine of x plus 2 pi minus 1. Then graph two periods of the function. All right, amplitude, that's my A. Amplitude here is 1, all right? Um, period, how do I find period? 2 pi over b. 2 pi over b. B here is 1, so they're being very nice to us, 2 pi. All right, frequency is just the reciprocal, right? So for frequency, it's just gonna be one over two pi, just the reciprocal, all right? Um, they want phase shift, phase shift. So for this one, they're also being nice. It's C over B, technically negative C over B. So it's just negative two pi. By the way, if your frequent your phase shift is any 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 form of two pi, it, it's gonna be the same. It just moved it a whole cycle, right? Does that make sense? So it just moved it an entire cycle. So if your phase shift is two pi, you can just start at zero if they it's just want you to negative, draw one. Even when it's supposed to it's, it's negative, negative, yes, because it's um negative C over B. Yes. And C here is positive. But what I'm saying is if you took your cycle and moved it back an entire 2 pi, it's going to look exactly the same because 2 pi is a standard cycle, right? Um, and the period didn't change. So your period is 2 pi as well. So um, nothing changed here. We can actually start at zero for this one and it will not affect it. All right. So then my vertical shift. My vertical shift here is my D. So my vertical shift here is negative 1. Negative 1. This is a sine function. So if I were to take this, we'll just zoom in a little. All right, because my phase shift is a two pi, I can just start at zero here. I don't have to worry about left and right. Um, they actually gave me no changes here. My amplitude is one, my period is two pi, my phase shift is negative two pi, which is a full cycle. The only thing that's changing is my vertical shift. So we're just doing it basically with just a vertical shift here. All right, so if I zoom in here, normally, I would start this function right here at zero, all right? I am now gonna have a midline of negative one. So here's my midline that I am gonna use, all right? So this is a sine function. So where I would normally start here, I'm gonna start shifted down one right here, all right? Since my cycle is two pi, here's my starting and ending point left and right. Here's my middle. Here's my one-fourth and my three-fourths, right? 
If I start here, my amplitude is one. So I need to go up one away from my midpoints. So I, at my one fourth of the way through, I am gonna be up here at zero because one up from negative one is zero, right? And then at my halfway point, I'm gonna be back at my midline, negative one. At my three fourths, I'm gonna be at my lowest, which is one away down from my midline. That's negative two. And then I'm going to end at my midline, which is negative one. So this is my sine graph if I'm shifted the way this one shifted me. All right, so all it did is it took the sine graph and it moved it down. Now, hear me, they were kind on this one because you didn't have any other changes, but you can literally have a vertical shift, a phase shift, a period change, and an amplitude change, right? And so that's why you have to methodically mark these. You wanna find where your midline is, you want to um, do your shifting, and then you wanna mark your points and graph it. All right, and so that's what this last thing says right here under graphing when we get to number five. So it says first step. The first step is to find those four things. Find your amplitude, your period, your phase shift, and your vertical shift, all right? And then it's using the midline and your phase shift, so um, you're gonna find, um, actually, no, not that one, for that one. For the second step, you want to use your um, period and your phase shift to find the starting and ending points, all right? So phase shift is gonna tell you how you're moving from zero. Period is gonna tell you where you're gonna end from there. So using your period and your phase shift, find the starting and ending points. And then find the maximum minimum using your um, amplitude and midline. Your amplitude and your midline. All right? So your midline tells you where the middle of the graph is. Your amplitude tells you how far up and how far down to go from your midline. Bless you. All right? So you're going to use your, find all of them. Use your period and your phase shift to find the starting and end point. Use your amplitude and your midline to find um, the maximum minimum points that you're going to get to on that graph. All right? So let's try one.
All right. Oh, I didn't give you. Where's the...